Matthew 28. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The first thing that the Holy Spirit is pointing out to me here is actually the attitude of evil, the attitude of Satan, which is deceive, cover up, bribe, right? Because he doesn't have a license to do business through us unless there's some sort of sin that we're succumbing to. Don't tell me that the soldiers were just following orders No, they took money. They were likely afraid of what would happen to them if they didn't obey. That's still a sin. We are going to face things and are already facing things that cause us concern about what's going to happen to us if we don't obey. Still a sin. And the reason why I feel the Holy Spirit directing my attention to this is because we're told that the Antichrist is going to flatter those who break the covenant, but he's going to kill and persecute those who are his holy people, God's holy people, and who maintain fidelity to Christ and faithfulness to the covenant. So he's going to flatter and give some sort of reward to those who break the covenant. In talking about the Antichrist, the word says that he will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a God of fortress, a God unknown to his ancestors. He will honor with gold and silver and precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortress with the help of a foreign God and will greatly greatly honor those who acknowledge him. Listen to what he's going to do. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. So is he going to flatter them? Is he going to give rewards to those who dishonor the covenant. He will honor those who acknowledge him. Do I care about the gifts that he's going to give them? Not really. And I don't think that God necessarily does either. What I care about is what is the enemy trying to accomplish here? The only thing that those gifts have done is entice the people's, it's shown the people's heart, or maybe I should speak, you know, about the future. It's going to show the people's heart. It is already showing the people's hearts. This is what Satan has done all along. These people are choosing to reject God's covenant, to engage in adultery against him, to submit to and honor the Antichrist. So what do you think these people are going to do? Are they going to speak against God's servants? Are they going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, speak evil against the Holy Spirit in them? The Holy Spirit who is speaking through his witnesses? Are they going to lie about God? and the covenant. Oh, you're already saved. God has already done for you. There's nothing that you have to do for him. Well, what's happening right now in the counterfeit churches? 
They're not serving God. They're serving something else. They're preaching a counterfeit covenant. They're preaching a counterfeit salvation. They're preaching a false Messiah. All for the love of money because you cannot serve both God and money. Just as these soldiers were willing to lie about whether Christ had risen, to lie and accuse his disciples of stealing his body. The next thing that the Holy Spirit points my attention to is this idea of worship. Because it says it a couple times in this passage. And we've talked about worship. We've talked about worship being service to God, submission to God. We've talked about Romans 12.1 when Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is good, pleasing and perfect. What is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God? I don't want you to think that just dropping at Jesus' feet is worship. Worship is what's coming from your heart. It is that submission and that conformity to God. That is worship. True worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what's said in John 4. It's not just that your body is laying prostrate before him. It's not just that you're clasping his feet. It's not just that your tears are washing his feet. It's that your heart is submitted and conformed to him so that everything that is coming out of your right hand, your deeds, your your forehead, your thoughts, your mouth, the way you speak, the things you speak about, the testimony that you share, True worshipers must worship him in the spirit and in truth. They could not have known that he was the Messiah if the Holy Spirit hadn't told them. We know that because when Peter acknowledged him as the Messiah, Jesus said to him, what? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And likewise, it was revealed to them by his father in heaven through what? The spirit and in truth. The only way that you're going to know that he is Christ is if you're truly pursuing truth, because there's no real kickback here of the world. We talked about the Antichrist who's going to flatter and is going to distribute the land at a price and is going to, you know, do all of these things. He's going to reward according to the values of the world. But for those who serve God, their hearts are set on something bigger Their hearts are set on something true that this world does not value. So falling down at his feet is an acknowledgement of who he is. It's an understanding of who he is that could only have been revealed to those who worship in the spirit and in truth. These are those who truly believe. These are true worshipers because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they knew the words more than anybody. They lorded it over people but they weren't worshiping in the spirit or in truth. And we know that because it wasn't revealed to them because they were able to spit on him and hit him and crucify him and persecute him and speak all kinds of evil against the Holy Spirit in him, claiming that what he was doing was by the spirit of Beelzebul. How does this look in our lives now? We got to be falling at his feet every day. Our soul has to know what that feels like to fall at his feet every day. Yeah, I got all these things on my to-do list today. And yet the only thing that matters is whether or not I have submitted to and conformed to the purpose that you have in me today. Right now in this moment, am I in the name? Am I serving the name? Am I receiving your building of me even in your rebuke? in your discipline, in the hardship that you bring on me, in the breaking and the crushing and the bringing me low and reducing me to nothing. Look at the example of Job. His own wife told him to curse God and die. He endured in all of that, even though his sin for all intensive purposes, according to the word, was not compensatory to what was going on there. And yet God says, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what my purpose is. You're a lump of clay. You were formed from the dust. To the dust you will return. Brace yourself and I will question you. Are we broken like that? Are we broken like that on a daily basis? Submitted, conformed, 
falling at his feet, transformed by the renewing of our minds through his daily bread, through ingesting that teaching so that his flesh and his blood becomes a part of our bodies. You must feast on my flesh. You must drink of my blood. Why did he say that? And why did he make that part of the covenant? Because being submitted and conformed and receiving his daily bread, feasting on his flesh, drinking of his blood is our covenant. If we're receiving that, then we're going to do it. What we receive into our hearts is going to come out of our deeds, our thoughts, and what we speak. It will even come out in having him before us, would we not drop? Would we not drop and clasp his feet? If we know him and he knows us, if we recognize who he is, of course we're going to do that. If we've been doing that in our souls, then of course we're going to do that in our body. And the last thing that stands out to me is the command that he gave to his disciples. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, Make disciples of all nations. You understand we all have to be a disciple. What is a disciple? A disciple is a student. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Are the teachers, the false teachers in these counterfeit churches, are they teaching us to obey everything he has commanded us. No, modern day counterfeit Christianity is all about what he has done for you. But you don't receive any of that until you fulfill your part of the covenant. And on the other end of the continuum are churches who lord over laws, a rule for this and a rule for that, a little here and a little there, screaming at you from the pulpit, not coming alongside you, not sharing their own sins with you, their own testimony of how they've healed. No, screaming at you from the pulpit, slamming their fists down, teaching you things like you're not allowed to question God's anointed. No, that's a responsibility that was placed on God's anointed not to be doing things that are questionable. But they distort that and twist it to say, you can't question them. You most definitely must question them. You most definitely must question me. It's my responsibility to not be living in a questionable way. That is what it means to be above reproach. Slamming their fists on the pulpit and telling you that a wife must submit to her husband. Neglecting to mention that if the husband is living as Christ, as the head, he also submits to the wife and serves her with humility. He doesn't lord his authority over her any more than Christ lords his authority over us. Taking the seats of honor, wearing their phylacteries long, slamming the door to the kingdom of heaven in your face, distorting the word of God, picking and choosing what commands they'll follow, even returning you back to the law the laws that have already been fulfilled. Feasting on your flesh, tearing off your hooves. That's how God describes the worthless shepherds. And it's the reason why he shepherds them himself. The most oppressed of the sheep marked for slaughter. This is our job. This is what we're supposed to be doing. I tell you all the time, it has to start with you as an individual. You have to receive God's ministry first He has to heal you first as an individual. Then you have to do well with what you've been given. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've done well with a little. Now I will give you more. You have to prove worthy with what he's already given you guys. You can't go out there making your own ministries. I did not receive this from myself. I teach you how I received it and I teach you what I received from him and what I receive each and every day from him. And once you have done these things, He's going to build your lampstand. You don't go taking someone else's lampstand. You don't go capitalizing on someone else's lampstand. You can share. If you've discerned someone to be a true shepherd of God, then you share. You have a responsibility to share what they're doing, but you do not covet what they're doing. God is going to build in you what he has set you apart to do. 
And I have watched people do that. People close to me claiming that they're now in God's ministry because they're sharing my videos with other people. That's not being in God's ministry. You're just sharing with them what God has discerned and that's good. But here's the thing. Don't stop there. You can't stop there. You're not here to serve me. You're here to serve him. You won't be, sh- you won't be saved by the message that he's built in me. You're going to be saved by the message he's built in you because you received it from him, not because you received it from man. That's why I speak to you in the way that I speak to you. That's why I'm always shepherding you back to him. That's why my message is valuable because of how I speak to you, because I, I speak truth. But he's been very clear with me that I am not to step in the role of God because you have a purpose that he set you apart for. You have a lampstand that he intends to build. And look at Revelation 2 and 3. He tells five out of those seven churches that they're about to have it taken away. If you sit on that lampstand or you bury it or you put it in your closet because you can't be bothered to be built, you can't be bothered to receive from him, you're too busy receiving from man, that lampstand will be taken away. That is the purpose for which you were set apart in the body, in the kingdom, in the temple. You have to serve your function and your purpose. There's no social loafing in God's kingdom. You're not going to hide in anyone's pocket or hang on to their coattails. God will recognize that you are not dressed for that wedding feast and you will be kicked out. You need to recognize that when God is talking about those lampstands, he is saying, if this lampstand is taken away, you have also lost your salvation. They go hand in hand. Whether or not that lampstand is built and God actually sets his light on it for you to be the light of the world determines whether you've fulfilled your covenant. If you don't walk into or live into that purpose, you have not fulfilled your covenant. So you do need to recognize what stage you're at. Is he still working on you as an individual? Is he now working on you in your own household, convicting you that these are the things that you need to do? Because he is indeed building you through that process. But until he starts telling you what you're doing in his church, you have not been activated in that calling. And that is a really important part of your covenant. Stay where you are. Stay where he has you. But don't be lazy. Don't be complacent. Don't hide things in your closet that you're not willing to deal with because everything is laid bare before him. And his opinion is the only one that matters. His truth, what he knows, is the only thing that matters. You got to do away with the things that are holding you back from looking at those things, the cowardice, the laziness, the fear. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to fear him and and him alone. Oh, that reminds me of that dumb saying that we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. You see all those stupid distortions in the world? We have nothing to fear, but fear itself. No, we have nothing to fear, but God. And had that been said to the people instead of that ridiculous saying, that judgment would have been turned away because people would have known that they needed to return to God. Nice job, Roosevelt. And here's what God says to those who are serving him, to those who are truly worshiping him in the spirit and in truth. And this is coming out in their deeds, in their thoughts, in the way that they speak. They are making disciples of all nations. They are baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything he has commanded us. He says, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He's with us and he has to be the one moving us, the one to whom we are connected. Not to God's, I mean, you are connected to God's shepherds, but not in the same way that you're connected to Christ. Those shepherds cannot move you. They cannot tell you how to pick up what God has set you apart to do. I can tell you that you're supposed to make disciples of all nations, nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything to obey everything he's commanded. But only his spirit can show you how to walk into that in the correct way. Counterfeit teachers are doing these things, and they're not for one second serving God. These are the very people that God is going to turn to and say, depart from me, I never knew you. Depart from me, evildoers. And yet they just said that they've been doing all these things in his name. And yet they're evildoers. These are the teachers and the prophets and the priests claiming to serve him. And he says he doesn't know them. But for those who are in him, he is with us to the very end of the age. He is not going to leave us 
We are not going to have to fabricate or figure out what we're supposed to be doing for him. We receive it from him. We don't go knocking on every door. We don't go trying to save every soul. We receive it from him. He's the one who moves us. He's the one who tells us what to do on a daily basis. And he has taught me that emphatically. When I have stepped apart from anything that he has told me, he has dealt with me. He has not chosen everyone on this earth. Not everyone on this earth is our brother and sister. And so when you make up your own ministry like these counterfeit churches do, you start making God's word for everyone. You start diluting it. He knows the one he, ones he's chosen. He knows the ones who can accept his message. Listen to what I said. When you start making this for everyone in the world and you start saying they're all our brothers and sisters, all of them are God's children. No, they're not. Christ didn't waste his time with people who didn't hear the message. He dusted his feet just like he taught his apostles to do. He identified and discerned them as children of the devil. He spent his time with people who could hear his message because he discerned the ones that God was telling him to work with. I pray that you'll be able to hear this message and I pray that you will pray regarding whether this message is true. And if it is true, that you'll receive it in your heart. God bless you. Thank you for listening and I'll see you in the next video.